Hello and welcome to Main Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Jenny Nuttall, a lecturer in English at Exeter College, Oxford, and the author most recently of a book called Mother Tongue, A History of Women's Words. We spoke about the way that women's social history can be glimpsed through the history of language, discussing words including uh, gossips, spinsters, and testicles. The extended version of this episode can also be found at my substack, louiseperry.substack.com, where you can also find bonus episodes and the MMM chat community. Enjoy. Hi, Jenny. I wanted to start by talking about um, pregnancy and words for pregnancy, because I discovered um, a word from reading your book, which I'd never come across and which I'm now absolutely determined to uh, you know, enter into my everyday vocabulary, which is um, varnishing. I told my grandmother about this word, <laughs> so it comes from. So it's a word for it's a word for being pregnant, right? But it's an active verb for being pregnant, and it comes from. Correct me if I'm misremembering this. Um, a, an old word for children, barns, and then the the the, the, the suffix describes the fact that you're kind of fashioning them, you're making them. And I mentioned this to my grandmother because I thought it was great. And she recalled that her mother, who was born in the north of England and then emigrated to, to Australia, used to talk about barns. Um, so she immediately understood what it meant. But um, I, I thought it was so charming, partly because, as you write, there aren't really very many active verbs for pregnancy that are still in circulation. Um, we talk about being pregnant or, or we, we talk about it in quite a passive voice generally. But if we, if we look back in, in, in earlier periods of um, English, there are all sorts of amazing words that we could use. Yeah, I think that's right. And I was very struck that, yeah, as you say, these kind of passive words ca- carrying gestation, which sounds rather kind of scientific and formal and interesting, actually just does mean to carry it's um it's from that that route so I was on the lookout particularly in the in the middle English dictionary which records all these kind of rare words and dialectal words for for any words that actually describe the kind of I mean they're they're partly words which are describing a, a body growing big but they're also words you can also child in middle English she's childing she childed and it describes the whole process the kind of making of the the child and yeah barnishing is lovely I think because it has those sort of sound echoes of kind of burnishing and barnishing and kind of growing and flourishing um and yeah as you explain it has that word Ben, we know sometimes from Scots or barn in the north of England and it makes it like childing a, a word about the kind of not just the the carrying of a child, but the making of a child. Yeah, just stating, um, as you say, doesn't quite mean what we might want it to mean because it because it is so passive, and also it sounds very I don't know clinical. It's not something that you'd use colloquially now to talk about um, talk about reproduction. Um, and reproduction is another one, right? So we talk now about reproduction, but we've had this transition from early early modern period of talking about generation could you talk a little bit about how we've 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 transitioned in how we talk about the, the, the whole process yeah so these are these slightly more formal words for describing human reproduction and the the older words might be procreation or generation um which as you can see have that sense of kind of humans as part of nature a kind of replenishing themselves kind of re remaking recreating generation after generation there is gradually this shift towards what we might say now more formally procreation and because it the shift sort of happens across that period of the industrial revolution some historians have, have spun a rather too simple narrative that it shows us perhaps that that um thinking is moving away from seeing this as a kind of natural thing to a, to a more kind of mechanical um, set of reproductions. The, the story is a bit more complicated. It relates to reproduction starting to be used in natural history to explain the way in which um, 
plants and animals kind of continue to 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 make themselves and to kind of use resources to continue and and reproduction also starts to appear in economic thinking um to to describe how you know you can have um subsistence but you can also have reproduction you can have kind of economic activity which kind of makes capital which you can use then to kind of make more things and those are those new senses of the word if eventually um get also applied to to human reproduction but it takes a long time and i think the more interesting part of the story is is the opposite in a way that that when we talk about human reproduction we we don't tend to kind of acknowledge its economic importance and its importance uh, it, it, you know it's, its ultimate productivity um and ha- how it relates to to words like regeneration say or recreation that that idea of kind of active making so so you get this fl- funny split where re- reproductive labor starts to refer to more economic things but that meaning doesn't doesn't come with that newer word reproduction and i was interested to try and it's quite a complicated history but to kind of unpuzzle that story in the book it's the really lovely thing of, about looking at these um old words is it does give us a, a real glimpse into older ways of thinking as well um i mean a word like labor is interesting as well isn't it because now of course we use it to mean childbirth and we also use it to mean economic labor but the word that I mm. recall from, so I, I should say that when I I did a master's and I almost did a PhD in the history of obstetrics in Britain and particularly interested in the 17th century. And the word that I recall coming across most often was travail. I don't know how they would say, I mean, mm. it's, 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 it's taken from the French clearly. I don't know how English people would have pronounced it at the time. Yeah. Can you tell me anything about the use, how the use of the word labour has come to be the most common term now to talk about childbirth compared with its other competitors at other times and places? Yeah, I mean, tra- I suppose travail and labour almost just kind of synonyms for each other and, and both of them having this, this, um polysemy this this you know a word can have several sets several meanings depending on the context and it can refer more broadly to um activity and then it they both words also gain quite early on in medieval english uh, they're used for particularly difficult activity um of, often with with a kind of qualify you know hard labor difficult labor it it, it that meaning starts to kind of take over. It's not just sort of doing stuff, it's doing stuff that's kind of difficult or arduous. And then eventually you get this specialised meaning in both words that's to do with um, the, the the physical strains and stresses of labour. I suppose those two meanings kept together by that Genesis account of, you know, men, men will have to labour for human sustenance and women will get hard labour in childbirth. So the, there's a kind of myth that kind of parallels those two meanings. But I suppose a bit like reproduction, it's it's this peculiar thing that the there in the history of the word is a kind of acknowledgement that this is uh, hard and it connects to to all sorts of kind of human industry and activity. But yet we don't often think of it as Label. We think of it as pain, and then there will the mess around kind of what type of birth you have. But it's um, it's interesting that you know I found in the book that lots of stories were sort of close to the surface, and yet we couldn't see them sometimes in the way it gets talked about. And that was why it was a an interesting project for me to to kind of pause and kind of work through the etymologies of things to just think, you know, what. What did we used to know and acknowledge, or what does the history of this word sort of bring with itself? And, and do we really register that when, when we use it today? And it potentially gives us the opportunity as well to get a glimpse into working class women's lives, which is, you know, an infamously difficult thing to do um, as a historian because they didn't tend to write things down, they didn't tend to um, to leave much in the way of records. But things like things like 
vernacular terms for things do sometimes give us amazing insight. Um, filtered, I suppose, always through you know who is writing it down um, is always an issue. But do you think that there's a do you think there's a sort of power there for for historians potentially in um, and in 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 glimpsing social history through etymology? I think so, and you're absolutely right. I mean, some some people have looked at the his, the the title of this book, the surprising history of women's work, and and imagined and hoped that I sort of somehow discovered a set of material that feminist historians had you never know, women in their own voices. And you're exactly right that that's very very hard to find e- everything filtered. But I, but I found in dictionaries and partic- and, and word books, particularly in that phase of the history of the English language where um English words are appearing as as glosses to Latin or other languages and particularly in early dictionaries you get lots and lots of glosses that that you can um discover or I discovered that or kind of found found what was kind of there waiting that you know, we might call a, a labour pain a contraction, but if you go to early dictionaries the Latin equivalent and the 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 glosses give you words like hang or, or throw, and you think, well, I have no guarantee that was the everyday word, but it seems much more likely that there was a kind of vernacular um, set of expressions that weren't slang and weren't formal. They because English was was more was not quite yet the language of kind of formality in all sorts of ways. Um, so yeah, sort of w- words might be a, a good way into, um, as you say, just these very very faint traces of what what we might imagine was was being talked about. And and the language of labour, childbirth, does have this funny mix of um, quite formal medical language and then things like bearing down and crowning. You think, well, that that's something else again. You know, there's there's, there's a sort of mix of language there, and it's interesting to think about how they even what sort of language we're thinking through that um, activity. And I know it's a long time ago now, but when I was getting ready to give birth, I found reading first-hand accounts much more helpful than than kind of formal medical explanations of what to expect. I think even then I was kind of thinking that if I could just find the right set of words, that would help me through. This is, of course, the, the period that we're we're roughly talk well i mean you cover a very long a long time period in in your book um but th- there's a particular emphasis on um medieval and early modern period and and it, it's at the end of the early modern period right where you start seeing in relation to um childbirth this so the popular feminist history which i think neither of us are completely convinced by is that it used to be that childbirth was completely the domain of women and local midwives who had kind of um, uh, women's knowledge that had been accumulated and transmitted verbally over time. And then you had the man midwife who became the obstetrician who arrives on the scene and kind of wrests this from women's hands. And and so you see uh, uh, one, you know, the, the, the medicalization of childbirth, which eventually results in hospitalization later on. And you also, I guess, see language changing in that maybe you'll you'll see this as you're saying, you know, Latin being the the formal language of of medicine is going to start to predominate over the vernacular language of of the midwives. Except I think that that's not quite the. It's a nice story, but it's not quite true, right? <laughs> that you see that kind of neat handing over of men like wresting this away from women. You're right. I mean, a lot of what I've found as I was trying to sort of fill in the the context around words that that there were never kind of simple stories um and it you know you had to be quite skeptical of you know the 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 there was not perhaps as much kind of misogyny and sexism as you might expect in the past but you also had to be careful that the feminist history had to be accurate too and that you you weren't making a, a kind of counter narrative that was very attractive but not not fully accurate and you see in the in the medieval period it's certainly kind of women um knowledgeable women in the community women that we would think of as midwives who who because of ideas of decorum and and propriety and kind of women dealing with women's bodies 
have a certain practical knowledge, but they're they're calling in um, medically trained men when they need to for difficult cases. And the evidence seems to be that, you know, it, it wasn't a kind of world that men were entirely excluded. It was it was a kind of mixed world. If if needed, they could be there, and if not, um, and and then even even in that period where um, male midwives are, are coming in, it. In many cases, it's it's women, wealthier women, who are very keen to use their services and to give birth in hospital. Um, so there is a sort of a push. You can think of it as a push pull, but you can also think of it as a kind of cooperation through these periods between sort of book learning and medical training, and then the kind of knowledge women have accumulated. And it's not always an antagonistic relationship. There's a there's a kind of mutual respect, and then at the end of the 17th and early early into the 18th century because of the the economics or there is a bit of a kind of turf war then about which you know are, are the male midwives with their book learning and their mechanical instruments dangerous or is it the the, the midwives who who aren't up to speed on some of the advances in in anatomy and gynecology are they dangerous and it's a sort of it's two two sets of professional expertise kind of battling it out I, I think but it, yeah it's not a the, the, the two sides are kind of interacting all the way through the history. We know now that probably it was, you know, things like forceps were were clearly saved the lives of mothers and babies, but but lots of hospital infections probably took just as many, at least as many. So it kind of mm. it wasn't a simple story either of the men midwives necessarily being the safer option. It was a bit of both. Yeah, that made me think of even the choices we make now. You know, you make the choice between a home birth or or a midwife led centre or a hospital birth. It's it's that it's a sort of similar you want some ideal access to all three, you know, depending on kind of how your labour develops. Um and I think probably it's the sort of separating out of those things later on that produces a lot of tensions. Whereas if you look at some of the the medieval medical textbooks, they'll say, you know, midwives and women do this, this is what normally happens, but if you're needed this is what you might do, and you know this is what to bear in mind. So there's there's more of a sense that the the two groups can work together. It's so easy, isn't it, when you're reading very old medical texts to feel it's very smug and patronising towards these these ancestors who 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 were so incredibly wrong <laughs> about so many things. But of course, that's a completely inappropriate emotion because they 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 were very learned for their time. And they were doing their best. And actually, the thing that I found quite nice about reading some of the um, accounts that you quote of um, male um, medical writers describing women's ailments is they're really quite sympathetic. Actually, often they're not. Quite, they're not as there isn't the misogyny that you might expect to see. Actually, and or not always. And um, like I can't remember who it was, but there's a line you quote from a from a, from a medieval doctor who says, um, um, "Ask the woman." <laughs> it's like you know really actually very good advice on bedside manner to be really attentive to what the patient is saying yeah and that I think that comes from really probably one of the oldest medical books we have in English one of the old English leech books and it's describing what again if if needed you might call on um male medical learning but even even around the year 1000 exactly as you say someone thinks to write down well uh i think that the 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 treatment and the issue they're discussing is to do with delayed menstruation and the the kind of bringing on of periods and and what 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 treatment to administer at what moment but but the the male medics know that a woman's menstrual cycle is her own knowledge and that if you will need to ask your patient and they're quite clear that there are differences between um, male bodies and female bodies and children's bodies even in these earliest textbooks and some of the yes some of the the theory in inverted commas and the science they're drawing on we we still see very clearly as uh, motivated reasoning as it were ways to justify sexism and, and a society that kind of limits women's roles but but yeah, I, I I think I didn't really sort of think about it so much when I was writing, but it, it was interesting to sort of match up, say, university and religious um, 
men writing about these topics and then you look at what the the, the medical people and through into the renaissance there's this wonderful guy called thomas reynolds who writes something that he called the woman's book um and he's very aware that that menstruation differs from woman to woman and that, that childbirth can have various outcomes and that that you you don't just sort of impose knowledge here you have to ask yeah so you see these sort of glimpses almost of ordinary women feeding into the thinking of some of these um these great men yeah <laughs> um th- talking for a moment as well about some of the uh w- without wanting to go into detail about some of the anatomical stuff um which is um um there are words there are words in your book that I would not say on the podcast even though generally we're not we're not we're not one for censoring <laughs> on the podcast but there are some very rude words which were in circulation um <laughs> including in medical text sometimes and um and also some very interesting ideas about sexual difference between men and women, um, because you do have doctors noticing, or anatomists, noticing the fact that there are some ways in which the male and female reproductive systems are kind of strangely strangely mirror each other, like the fact that there are two testes and two ovaries. and So, so you sometimes see shared words, like I think stones is one of the words that's used to describe both testes and ovaries. And the idea of the vagina maybe being an inverted penis and all these kind of all this thinking about how do you how do you understand sexual difference once we've actually started anatomizing people and 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 seeing some of the seeing some of the unexpected similarities between the two sets of organs that was that was another sort of complicated set of narratives where there was you know you will read certain historians um citing um Thomas Lacoste's one sex theory that sort of predominate through this period the people are not thinking in terms of two sexes but but sort of two varieties of one sex a, a kind of which are inverses of each other and but I think what I what I found is that, that that's only one narrative amongst others and it it's to misrepresent history to assume that 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 was what was understood widely it, it would be more accurate to think of it as kind of one academic theory among many and we have to be very careful with that idea of inverse it's it, it, you know there's a, there's a strand of thinking from from Galen onwards very helpful for for male medics in training who know their own bodies but maybe you know, in, in the world of kind of clerical celibacy, you think they're maybe much less familiar with with women's bodies. Who who it helps to tell them this is like this. Think of this as a kind of reverse of this. But it might those homologies, as they're called, might simply be um, as if or like. Um, and there's another strand of thinking all the way through this period, which is very clear that. Um, human bodies are alike in some ways but different in other ways and you have to take those differences into account and um you can make a very um broad brush and engaging narrative to say oh the past thought like this but i've drawn on the work of some some really amazing um historians of medicine and history of science who've, who've gone back and kind of checked out this idea of, of one sex and find it's always challenged it doesn't appear across all domains at at certain periods it's being described even in the 16th century as ridiculous and absurd the idea that 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 everything is a kind of inverse of everything else um sometimes it's sometimes even in texts where they are you know, you, you find this in modern academia today. They give a kind of, they acknowledge the theory and then do a completely different set of things, which make it clear that, that they must think of something other than than simple homology. So, um, yeah, and, and, and it matters for my book because one of Lacquer's pieces of evidence is that there aren't really words for female sexual anatomy in the vernacular and that's because everyone's thinking in terms of kind of arts inverses well that's that's true in the case of stones over his 
testicles. And it's partly because medical science hasn't quite worked out, well, won't work out for several centuries how ovulation fits into this. So, it, you know, if you if you assume that men have seed and women have seed, it, make, it makes sense for those two to be described in very similar terms. But for other body parts, including all of those words which I've been carefully not saying um, when I've been on the radio, <laughs> things like that, um, they're not always being described in in this homologous way and that they're quite many experts of their time are quite clear that um the homologies don't really work as it were they you know what's the womb in this you know how, how does it all fit together the it, it, it's it would be better to think of those statements as a kind of pretty out there theory of early medicine than the the kind of way that the whole society thinks. And I was interested to try and um, correct that narrative a bit and and to show that there are words and ways of writing about the need to take account of um, sexuate difference that kind of divided the human body into two sexes. I always found the liqueur thesis very confusing when I was an undergraduate, (laughs) the idea that I mean, my, my initial interpretation of it was that, okay, so before the Enlightenment, people didn't know that men and women existed. Okay. <laughs> Which, of course, is not quite what he's saying. But the, no. I, I guess the idea is that, that, yes, the idea is that there was greater emphasis in medical writing before the Enlightenment on similarities between the sexes anatomically and then greater emphasis post-Enlightenment on differences between the sexes. But... Yeah, as you say, that there there have always been different currents of thinking in play at, at any one time, and that simple narrative doesn't really map onto the way that people are actually thinking and writing at this period. Yeah, and that you know, motivated reasoning is important. Who who might be saying this and why, and what particularly you know, even even thinking about things like genre and what type of text this is. I mean, there's there's kind of things we understand as theory but if the theory is is clearly not mapping onto the practice then it um then it, it it's it's not really convincing as as an account of a of a cult of an idea that's kind of culture culture wide um i think i think the weirdly i think the, the latter part of it is a bit that's helpful that there is science and medicine 18th century, 19th century again. It's not. It's not neutral. It ha- has various reasons why it want might want to kind of reinforce the the sex binary and and to derive certain conclusions from 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 the way in which they're now framing the difference between the the sexes. Um, and we we can look at those, but but you you can tell that story without needing to kind of misrepresent what. The Middle Ages and the Renaissance think, and it's it's very noticeable in that book that it it has a set of theoretical models from the classical period, and then it jumps to a point in the Renaissance when those classical models are having a revival, and and for for quite a brief period of time have a certain sort of interest. I mean, it, you know, it's sort of the the opposite in a way to the kind of new anatomical work that's going on the kind of actual dissection you know people people are starting to kind of play around with different ideas but Lacour is 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 not careful enough about what happens in the in the middle and what you can find if you look at kind of English writing about medicine and, and about human anatomy and reproduction um it, it works if you if you take a jump as as many histories do across the medieval and even even across some of the things that are going on in the Renaissance. And I mean that that chapter took the longest and was the most difficult because I wanted to get that story as as, as informed as it could be from the from the work that's been done by um many, many excellent academic historians of, of medicine and science from from the publication of that book through through the the next 30 years but I get a bit frustrated that it's still trotted out as a kind of great fact about the pre-modern world you know I've got got an Anglo-Saxon translator in in the year 1000 saying there is a great difference between um, 
prepubertal and adult bodies and between male and female bodies. Yeah, they knew what was what. I, th- I mean, it's it, it it is amazingly easy, particularly when we're looking at something like well, medicine would be a prime example, as I've already said that that to, to be really condescending towards people of the past and to assume that they were foolish and had mad ideas that we now sort of objectively recognise to be false. But um, it's it's hard to tug oneself away from that. It's a very strong kind of present present centrism that um is hard to forget the good thing about writing as someone who teaches in my day job old english literature medieval literature i think there is a tendency especially people who are working um 18th 19th century to kind of look back and and make some of their stories by slightly kind of suppressing or not quite taking the time to kind of work out what was actually going on because the sources are difficult and the language can be difficult so i um even though i you know i'm i teach in the english literature department and part of the fun of writing this book was sort of catching up on a lot of kind of feminist history and gender studies material from the time since i was an undergraduate but i it did seem to me to be helpful to be someone who looks kind of from the the beginning of english thoughts and 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 knows that there's stuff there to be to be found in dictionaries and in in the way in which um, Latin and French expert writings, the writings of authorities, are being put into English, and what you might find if you sort of work through those texts, and that that might be a richer story. Yes, the the past is wrong about many things, but wrong in ways that we should think carefully, really carefully about. And I could see. Um, um, almost a kind of more more plural way of thinking that then rather gets kind of narrowed in. Um, this this is the kind of classic medievalist view that actually it's not the Renaissance; it's the narrowing of you know the, the kind of losing of a kind of rich mix of of ideas that, that jostle around as as we head towards kind of more um, monotonous narratives. I think. Yeah, the, the, I've met medievalists are, are, are justified in feeling quite um irritated by the I mean we literally use the word medieval as a synonym for bad <laughs> brutal and wrong <laughs> so yes um I want to talk more about women's work because particularly occupation titles is a really interesting chapter in your book but before I do you have mentioned dictionaries you've mentioned glosses who is just a brief note who is writing these who is writing down words in circulation and why are they doing it? And I presume that this is an, an, an enormous source of, um, an excellent source for, for modern historians, but what, what are these documents? I didn't really know that they existed. Well, I mean, I mean, sometimes when I'm saying dictionaries, I mean our uh, modern resources, so like the Oxford English Dictionary and the Middle English Dictionary, um, where, where you can kind of track back through a history of words. But... Um, from the 15th century onwards or even a bit before you have word lists say for latin and french and you know it's clear that for learners and for people who are maybe thinking in english as their mother tongue they're they're kind of recording synonyms for 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 latin terms and then at the beginning of the you know, in the sixteen hundreds, as education starts to happen a bit more in English and people's Latin perhaps is is not so good, you get the growth of uh, Latin to English dictionaries and then the first English dictionaries. It's interesting that they're often marketed as being for women who obviously won't have the Latin necessarily as much through their through their because they're excluded from education so women are right there at the kind of beginning of dictionary making because they're a useful excuse you can kind of say oh well actually we we need um multilingual so you get dictionaries of european languages with with english glosses and you get latin english and then you get sort of english in its own right who are often saying you know this is for 
there's what one I think says the lesser knowing men and the more knowing women and I he doesn't mean that women know more but what he means is that that you know that there's clearly a kind of growing set of women who read and who are interested in in kind of ideas and men may not be accessing those ideas in Latin but 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 want help to understand this interface so you again you've you've got a kind of you know the latin keyword and and then a bunch of synonyms and it, it, then you have to go away and look a bit at the kind of usage i i tried to be quite careful and not to simply say look this means that you have to go away and um there are great resources that way you can kind of search through big um corpora of of early modern text say and kind of look at how a word is is being used but um again that that kind of hierarchy of languages is useful i think because it does preserve some of these kind of everyday terms and then i wonder as as we become a more monolingual society where everyone is kind of reading and thinking in english apart apart from you know re really the elite scientific thinking that that language doesn't have that that sort of rich set of of synonyms you have very formal language and which can be difficult for a lot of, you know, that's what we find with kind of medical body terms now. It's not a kind of user-friendly set of words. So early early dictionaries and, and the the place of English in the kind of language hierarchies and education at that point give you, um, yeah, why, why have one word when you could have six or seven? And I find that period of English really interesting. Um, and, and w women are often mentioned in the story as as the kind of people who know these words or one one of each set of synonyms and might want to be able to kind of work their way across to the 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 more formal term that comes out of kind of education and and knowledge and science and that kind of stuff. And these autodidact women now have books available to them to to help in that effort. It's nice. Um, which brings us on nicely, actually, to this question of women's participation in public life, because uh, one of the things that you and in and in um, in, in the labour market, um, one of the things you write about, um, which may be surprised to many people who are not familiar with the social history, is that um, uh, well, two things: one, there was always a fairly goodish proportion of women who did not become mothers for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, we now have record levels of um, women not becoming mothers in, in the contemporary West, like a quarter or something like that, probably in my generation. But actually even, even long before contraception, we're still talking maybe 10% who don't get married, don't have children, don't necessarily become nuns. You know, nuns is always available as a kind of high status alternative to, um, to, to marriage. But, um, we have words like spinster, for instance, which we're now familiar with, um, as a word for a woman who's, who's an older woman who's unmarried, um, which I guess does quite literally come from a woman who spins for a living, because that's the sort of occupation that a woman, an unmarried woman, might have available to her. Yeah, and it's a useful word because it rem it prompts us to remember that. Yes, it's it's a it's very interesting to realise that not you know you you get taught um, virgin wife that, that, that you know that, that you, we assume that that kind of women are on a kind of pipeline maiden mother matriarch that's the <laughs> yeah so the work there are women you know this is one of the well in fact that women in northern Europe marry quite late so they're even if they end up becoming wives and mothers they're they're single folk for a good deal longer than we might think when you say quite late we're talking like mid we're talking like mid-20s right is that about so we're not talking teenage yes. brides we're yes. talking normal for the 1950s kind of age yeah but a word like spinster so that so there does need to be a legal category because if you're not married you have a different legal status and in in um official documentation there is a need for what's called additions so to explain who somebody is you get an addition kind of added on and for men it might be an uh, an occupation label but for women it's often to do with their uh, 
marital status, you, you get words like single women, you get, and spinster becomes one of those words, as you say, because it connects to an occupation. But it's a useful word because spinning, being a spinster is, is the thing, is, doesn't make you a lot of money. It's, it's the thing you might do to kind of add on to your work that you're already doing in, in someone else's household. So, so single women are quite economically vulnerable and on the, the margins. They're often in service. Um, th there are definitely lots of women who are single, but we, we mustn't kind of shake our pom poms too much and say, ah, oh, amazing, kind of empowered single women in the middle of ages and the Renaissance. It's, it's not that. We have words like spinster precisely because it says that, you know, they're kind of often um really you know the, the the society if you look at the the sort of history of labor laws prefers it if they're under someone's control and is worried if women are moving single women are moving around too much to try and raise their own wages or or living independently and and though wages for for those kind of women daily wages or annual wages are often kind of held down you know they they don't have the full ability to kind of market and sell their their labor and they might do things like um spinning you know when push comes to shove and you find that some of the other words for single women or or women who are unmarried in service have a have an etymological or a kind of usage overlap with with women who are selling sex to make a living it, it, again because they are economically vulnerable and it's a way to survive so you you can um Yes, you can see that, that it's not that everyone's a wife and not working in the medieval period or Renaissance period, but, it, but it's, a, it's a difficult way to live in society. It's not set up to kind of, those women are always having to sort of push against things that are trying to kind of keep them there as a kind of, you know, available resource to kind of be in service, to be, to be there where it's, where it's needed. Yeah, so two common misconceptions about this this period, the pre-modern period, that one, that everyone, all women get married, not so, and two, that women don't do, don't participate in the labour market, again, not so. But then you can see, and and you outline lots of um, occupation titles, which clearly illustrate that these are being done by women, you know, sometimes with the, the suffix made, so these are, these are, these are um, jobs intended to be done by women who are maids who've not yet got married, so like milkmaid or housemaid or whatever, which are still sort of understood by modern people um and it probably was quite well I don't know I think you mentioned that there there's probably some fun and independence to be found in that period you know if you're if you're going into say service as a housemaid age 15 and then you're expecting to get married at 25 and you have that decade of of having a degree of independence from your parents and having the ability to make some money for yourself and so on so it could be quite it could be quite good um Although I always think how enormously vulnerable young women in service were to sexual violence in all times and places. And we know that there are so many accounts of, you know, you, you read grim accounts of infanticide or whatever at this period, and it's invariably a servant girl who's, who's, who has an unwanted pregnancy. So there's a, you know, there's a really dark side to this women's work thing as well. And also the thing that you write about is the fact that women are doing a double shift. Poor women are doing a double shift already as we would now as we would now define it um in that yes they are doing all of this work and there's then you know there's maybe a temptation to look at this and say oh you see you know women have always been women have always been working women have always been kind of participating in public life and you're like yes but also in very difficult conditions you know women who are women who are trying to to hold down jobs in i don't know in agriculture or all, all, all the various sort of surprisingly physical jobs that women are often doing at this period while also being pregnant while also having young children that you know it's not really a these aren't girl bosses right <laughs> these are women who are who are completely exhausted I'm sure by their um the dual burdens of home and and also economic economic work there's a, a a sort of medieval job swap poem it's it's a kind of it's a source of humor is it with the idea that a husband and a wife might might swap uh, what they do each day and it presumably written by a man but but like a lot of humor it has a kind of truth in it and it has some very good descriptions of the difference between being 
you know, and it's something I can think of even even in, even in my own life. You know how my husband approaches his job and and my kind of juggle of of things. That you know, in this medieval poem, the, going out to the field and kind of getting on with something is is rather different to being um, what you find. You know, right right down deep in the history of English, and it's not really clear why, but there, there are gender segregation in jobs, as it were, and and when women do they do they do a lot of the same work but it's in a slightly different model and for women it's about juggling that with domestic tasks with child care and this medieval poem is very funny on how stressed this woman is um because she's been awake all night and then she's got to juggle two things at once and and she of course says yeah I'll swap um, and it's frustrating. The poem doesn't kind of carry on far enough to let us know what happens. There's, there's a hint that she's already made his work at home slightly more difficult than it would be by kind of fixing a few things before she goes out to the fields. And I r- rather like that. She's determined to make her point. But, um, yeah, there, you know, and the, there are guides to the very renaissance, popular renaissance genre, the kind of art of being a housewife. And, and many of those are very clear that that it's about having a huge to-do list and it's about juggling lots of things. And you also need to be able to um, jump in and do very, very physical things to aid the male workers when needed. And you might be paid a bit more money as a kind of, you know, you might get a little bit of money to, to do that. But but no one will come in um, and kind of help you with the other stuff. Although you do, that 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 set of women that we were just talking about, the, the women in, service the younger women you do have the sense of sort of households with with more than one woman obviously in the very poorest households not but in kind of bigger households more than one woman so a, a wife might be doing one thing and taking charge and helping her husband and there will be the the, the mates of various kinds who are able to kind of step in and I you don't want to be too romantic about it but but Presumably, there are ways in which, sort of, if you add that all up, you know, women women were hugely economically active. But the frustrating thing when you look at the records is that they don't generally tend to call themselves a this. You know, I am a plow woman. It's not. It's not that. But you can see them in the records doing everything, or or in these kind of household economies, kind of cooperating to get it all done. Yeah, the the, the fairly consistent story, I think, if you look at it the lives of pre-modern women or indeed the lives of women still living in subsistence agricultural settings for instance is that they work extraordinarily hard and it's very physically demanding life but it is not generally a lonely life that's kind of the trade-off whereas the modern we we live very cushy lives materially and we we do very little most most of us now in the modern west do very little manual labor um but we tend to be atomized and lonely so so that is you know the, the classic complaint of the new mother for instance the feeling of isolation which i think our ancestors generally didn't experience but of course you know it wasn't rosy they had an awful lot of other problems that we don't have to think about now um you write uh, as well about the um the origins of the word gossip which I love. I love the fact that the 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 what we the verb now gossip um, has a has a has a lovely etymology, which tells us a lot actually about how um, sort of women's homosocial lives in the early modern period. That these are your close friends, and these are, are friends who you might ask to be godparents. So godsip, gossip. Um, it, there is that association between groups of women and and talking a lot which is where it gets a lot of its connotation but it's also used to describe um the women who gather together around a woman giving birth and then in the lying in period to you know as as you say not a kind which can be a kind of lonely time now a kind of shockingly lonely time that after a week or two everyone kind of vanishes and you think it's, it's me and the baby this is quite scary but you know that the, the the stereotype of gossiping get gets kind of located in that group of close friends who or or friends is perhaps the wrong word but the, the you know these 
people who are connected to each other by all sorts of economic relationships kind of coming together to kind of support women through the actual process of giving birth and then um this time where it was acknowledged that the the women needed help immediately after the the birth and and that help would be both practical and a kind of supportive talking group and and that group get you know that's where that idea of gossip comes from the the kind of talking um that group of women might do it obviously starts to take on a kind of negative connotation because for a certain sort of male thinker the idea of kind of women talking privately about all these kind of things is perhaps has a certain kind of anxious charge connected to it and you might want to kind of mock them as kind of over talkative or kind of um you know, seditious in all sorts of ways, but but I like the idea that there's a sense of of every of everyone kind of coming together in a household, say, or in a community. And and I found that um, you know, even, even where a family can't afford it themselves, there are, there there's some evidence that kind of parish communities would step in to support women after childbirth. You know that 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 could be a kind of ch- part of a kind of the charitable work of a community would be making sure that that kind of uh, lying in period with gossips went ahead. So it wasn't necessarily a luxury of the rich; it was actually considered to be very normal, except for women who were very poor. Do you think you're exactly right? So we mustn't romanticize, and that you know, the, particularly at the lower end of things, life is 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 very very hard but but communities do work together to kind of put this lying in process yeah it, it's not simply you know very wealthy women enjoying doing nothing it, it's it's part of the the process between birth and kind of returning to public life that's seen as quite important in this period I've written about lying in elsewhere um because I find it to be a very very interesting example of um a lost period of women's social history, with the exception of um, some um, ethnic minorities still in Britain, African and Asian generally, who still practice something like lying, lying in. And and um, I was speaking to a woman recently, actually, whose family from Pakistan and was telling me that her mother flew over and this was stayed for several months. And this is just considered to be standard practice that you will have something like a lying in period when you have a, a new baby. And it's interesting when you look at the anthropological record and see that something like this exists seems to exist pretty much everywhere and it seems to be about the same period of time as well it's like 30 to 40 days generally so there seems to be a so it's not quite the fourth trimester fully but it's that crucial first month and everyone seems to have kind of reached the conclusion independently that that's an important first month and that it's really good to have other people around you particularly women who've had babies before who can be helpful and provide guidance and all of this. And we don't really have that anymore in the West, um, with a few exceptions. And I think that that's because we now have the technology that keeps babies and mums alive. We don't, you know, we don't need to worry quite so much about um, infection or, 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 or breastfeeding not going well or whatever because we have antibiotics and because we have formula and we have all the sort of, we have all the backup now that can keep mum and baby alive. Um, which is obviously a great thing. So we've we've so we kind of reached the conclusion. Oh well, we don't need to do lying, and then women can return. You know, all the all these 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 women, neighbours, aunts, grandmothers, sisters, whoever, um, they can they can be in the labour market during that period. They don't have to kind of be exiting the economic life to do lying in because we have other things to provide backup. The problem is, though, yes, we do have the backup. Yes, we keep mums and babies alive, but of you know, postnatal depression we know is extremely common. And I'm sure that that has an enormous amount to do with the fact that we kind of expect this. We expect what would have been a lying in period to be a period of isolation now. And I think that's not actually a natural way for humans to operate during those, those that crucial first month. And reading up on it, it was interesting to see, um, you, you can kind of, as people have studied it, the, the you you can pick up the fact that sort of the the economics of the the family and the, and the the kind of kinship group say and the, and the community need to be sort of temporarily rejigged to make this work 
uh, you know, that it might have to be charity, that employers might have to be understanding you. There are some few funny accounts of, of kind of men having to, you know, what they then have to kind of take on. It's a source of kind of humour. And I suppose perhaps the, the, the sort of um, the humour and the resentment and, and the, the kind of, you know, where something, the idea that women are just sitting around gossiping comes from is, is a kind of humorous take on the fact that all sorts of kind of gendered roles and kind of economic relationships are just slightly being put on hold as as this um process of lying in happens and that yes if it if it's not going to work for that family then you do have to dip into the kind of parish charitable coffers to kind of send someone along to help so it, it, yeah you're right that it that it it's, it's certainly not understood as a kind of isolating you know like paternity leave potentially this kind of strange sort of stepping out of all, all sorts of kind of economic and community relationships that it's sort of part of it and some of the the humor in the language of it is, is i think a response to the fact that you know suddenly this is a, a world where not everyone's wife and maid is is doing what they normally did because for a short period of time things will need to be different. Yeah, so like it's inconvenient, <laughs> but there's a but there's a, a collective recognition that it's also necessary. Yeah, 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 um, and also probably very annoying. I, I mean, I think I mean, yeah. I'm I'm sure that the the word gossip partly gets its negative connotations from men feeling a bit sort of suspicious of these women conspiring um I think probably also from the perspective of the woman who's just given birth I'm sure the gossips were probably sometimes really annoying <laughs> you know, when you're when you're trying to get some peace and quiet and you're surrounded by kind of I don't know getting different advice from your mother your mother-in-law your whatever I'm sure that there were periods when it was very <laughs> when it was very irritating um but also I mean literally life-saving in much more difficult conditions than we have now in terms of maternal and infant health so yes and I was it I you know it's a bit of a speculation but I was and, and I don't you know I think if we get to go too far again to think of it as that some kind of secret world some kind of secret from which men are totally ex excluded some of the historical work has shown that actually the the idea that there's, there's some kind of hard and fast thing going on of who's in allowed in and out of which rooms that's, that's probably kind of overstated um a bit but the in the period before birth and after birth and there the must have been you would hope a bit more of the kind of passing on and and in these households where there are younger unmarried women who've not yet children that the women might have um, not not secretly, but sort of passed on a lot of good practical sense and understanding about birth and kind of understanding about what happens afterwards and kind of drawn on local expertise, which again is very diff different. I mean, I think I was probably one of the the first in my my husband's group of friends to to have a baby, and you you suddenly think, okay, there's the health visitor and the internet, but but I'd quite like. I, I, I do see that they might all get annoying, but I would quite, it would have been more useful to kind of know a bit more about, about what was, what was coming. And then, you know, for the next five or 10 years, we would all phone each other and someone, my, my daughter's godmother, I remember bringing up and saying, did this happen to you? What do I do now? And I was like, okay, I, this, this bit I can tell you. And it, you know, the, you, you mustn't romanticize this very, you know, things much more difficult and dangerous, but it, but, but, and that being being the sort of scholar I am, the fact of talking and words, and the fact that these things are leave traces in the language, I think, show that that communication has to be a part of this. I mean, the goal, as I've written elsewhere, is lying in and antibiotics. You know, let's try and <laughs> let's try and have all of the sort of safe, the safety offered by new new medical tech, and also the the. Um, and also try and fight against the loneliness that characterizes modern motherhood. Um, Jenny, I want in the extended bit of the episode, which I'm going to um, start in a moment, to talk more about um, some of the sex stuff, some of the the, 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 the racy early chapters about um, how um, people wrote about sex, which is sometimes surprisingly bawdy. Um, and again, the popular narrative of people being... Um, reluctant to talk explicitly about sex in the past. It's clearly not true, actually, if we look at a lot of the, the records that we have. Um, but before we get to that, 
for everyone else watching, um, uh, what is your book? Where can they find it? Where can they um, find out more about your work? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so it's called Mother Tongue. This, I guess, the surprising history of women's words, and um, yeah, everywhere you would expect to find a, a book like this. Um, already out in the the UK and Commonwealth, and coming out in the the states with a different publisher with Viking at the end of August. Excellent. And is there is there anywhere else that you'd recommend people go if they're interested in learning more about the history of um, women's language? Not so much. I mean, that was one of the reasons that there was a, a, a kind of space. There's, there's lots of, uh, you know, Debbie Cameron, who you probably know about doing kind of excellent work in, in feminist linguistics. But it, it seemed to me that the, there wasn't anything that, that was kind of really there to, to kind of work through the, the early lives of some of these topics that we're very interested in. So yeah, it was, it was, me bringing a lot of material together I think. All right thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching that episode of Men Mother Matriarch and for all of your support it means an enormous amount for the growth of the show. If you want to hear bonus content an extra 20-30 minutes of conversation with the guest maybe a little bit more personal a little bit less filtered then you can go to my substack at louiseperry.substack.com where you can sign up for extended episodes and also bonus episodes and you can also access our chat community you can also support the show by subscribing on youtube or subscribing wherever you get your podcasts and rating and reviewing on apple podcasts is also really great for encouraging other people to give the show a try please also spread the word tell people that you know who you think might like it to give it give it a shot um the word of mouth effect is really valuable so we'd really appreciate it thank you so much everyone for listening watching and supporting what we're doing <laughs>